Greetings from Australia. Uh, my key message uh, for today is that deregulated markets are not unregulated markets. And I say this because much of the public discourse on our sector tends to be quite polarized at the extremes of thinking of electricity as either being publicly owned or regulated utilities, or on the other side of the spectrum as unregulated um, markets. And the reality is that regulation is and will continue to be an essential element of the industrial organization of the electricity sector. And it's really important to understand the details of the market design um, of the jurisdiction in question um, in, terms of to, in, in terms of really understanding it. Um, first and most obvious is uh, in terms of the, the impact of regulation is the tr uh, regulation of transmission distribution in any jurisdiction because these are monopolies even if they are privatized, uh, their rates are typically economically set or capped by a central regulator. And from a cost perspective, this is a really important component of the total retail bill. So comparisons between different jurisdictions need to take this into account. Secondly, the process of restructuring uh, is still not complete in many markets. Um, for example, in many US regions, while steps have been taken to introduce competition to the generation of electricity, uh, the introduction of competition to the retail sector still has ways to go. And this has really important implications for the incentives of players in the market and how they react and how, how they actually go about their business. And finally, even in markets where generation and retail is contestable, for example, in the Australian or New Zealand markets, Regulators still have a very important role to play in determining how, for example, resources are committed and dispatched, how prices are formed, um, especially with non-convex resources, any limits to pricing and bids, the procurement of ancillary and system services, and really the governance of network access. Uh, and, and so there's some really important roles that, that regulation will play and continues to play in markets. And, and that's really um, uh, a, a critical, critical element of the sector. So hopefully that sets us up for, for the discussion today. We started in hard times to bring us all in Into the laughter through thick and through thin For public power enthusiasts without and within Roll on enthusiasts, roll on Roll on, enthusiasts, roll on. Roll I'm Paul Dockery, the host of Public Power Underground and Senior Manager of Energy Resource Strategy and Planning for Seattle City Light. And I'm Almaz Nagesh, the co-host of Public Power Underground and Power Planner for Tacoma Power, recording today from Trondheim, Norway. Joining Almaz and I as this week's celebrity guest stars are Farhad Billy Mora, Moria and Conley Byers. Farhad Bilamoria is a visiting research fellow at Oxford Institute for Energy Studies and a doctoral candidate in the Energy and Power Group at the University of Oxford. Farhad has over 18 years of global energy experience as an energy professional covering electricity and gas markets across Australia, New York, and California. He is currently a consultant in energy markets and was previously with the Australian Energy Market Operator focusing on market design for reliability and security. Joining us from Melbourne, Australia, welcome Farhad. Thank you, it's great to be here. And, and what time is it in Melbourne, Australia, Farhad? It's just past 10. Oh, not okay. too bad. 10 p.m. Oh. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Okay, we're on the opposite sides of the clock here. Joining Almaz Farhad and I from Zurich, Switzerland is Dr. Conley Byers. Conley recently earned her PhD in electrical engineering at ETH Zurich and is an incoming environmental fellow at Harvard University. Her research uses tools from operations research, electrical engineering, and e economics to design decarbonized energy systems with a focus on power system operations and planning. Welcome, Conley. Thank you. Great to be here. It's exciting to have you. Uh, Zurich, Switzerland. What time is it in Zurich, Switzerland? A uh, very comfortable 2 p.m. in the afternoon. I think I got off easy with this trifecta of time zone matching. <laughs> yes, I uh, appreciate that. Oh, same as, as in Zurich. It's, it's 2 in the afternoon here. Yep. 
Okay. I never, I didn't know that actually. I did not know that uh, Norway and Switzerland were on similar time zones because I'm an American and uh, I guess my geography <laughs> is not always very good. Uh, it's, it's 5 a.m. here. Um, and get this, the, the coffee was not ground this morning. Uh, so I did, de I decided not to grind coffee at five in the morning and wake up the rest of my household. So I'm doing this without coffee today. It's going to be fine. It's going to be great. <laughs> Oh, wow. I'll you should have through. at least just boiled the beans. I mean, <laughs> get some kind of <laughs> caffeine in there. <laughs> I could have. I could have tried. I could have tried. That's for sure. Well, on Public Power Underground, we talk about the electric utility enthusiasm trifecta of electrification, markets, and people. On today's episode of Public Power Underground, we're talking about market design with academic researchers. We'll talk about lessons learned about deep decarbonization from electric markets around the world, play a wonky energy-inspired game, and as always, Almaz will ask an unscripted question in a segment we call Almaz's Insightful Question of the Week. Then we'll close it out with closing thoughts from Conley Buyers. But before we get started, a quick word from our presenting sponsor. Public Power Underground is brought to you by The Energy Authority. The Energy Authority is a nonprofit company that specializes in portfolio management and prides itself on leading communities through today's energy transformation. Owned by public power entities, TEA is more than just adjacent. They're as underground as it gets. TEA is on a mission to help clients maximize the value of their assets while meeting their power supply goals. Great mission. By providing expertise in energy trading, advanced analytics, advisory, and renewable solutions, TEA equips public power utilities with access to state-of-the-art resources and technology systems so they can respond competitively in the changing energy markets. With over 60 other public power utilities proudly partnering with TEA to tackle their energy future, it's time for you to consider breaking ground too. Let TEA help you navigate the uncertain future of our industry by visiting teainc.org. That's teainc.org to learn more today. Okay, Almaz, why don't you kick off the discussion? All right. Public Power Underground cracked open the Handbook on Electricity Markets for today's discussion of market design. The handbook bifurcates the discussion of market design between the legacy of electricity markets in use throughout the world and one part of the and one part and the adaptation needed for new technologies and priorities in the second part. Today, let's try to mush it together and extract lessons we can learn from integration of renewables and markets throughout the world today. In prep for the episode, Farhad claimed an accessible work on the topic is an article on hybrid markets by P.L. Josco titled, From Hierarchies to Markets and Partially Back Again in Electricity, colon, Responding to Decarbonization and Security of Supply Goals. With those two works that we'll link to in the show notes, we're going to try to cover four elements of markets in transition in 20 minutes. So this is gonna be fast. First, fat tails and increased exposure to extremes. Second, batteries and price responsive demand. Third, natural gas fragility and marginal pricing. And fourth, inverter driven resources and system security. So. Conley, we'll start with you. Pick one of the topics and try to link it up with the lessons learned from markets around the world. We're hoping you have um, some examples of events, news, resources, or, or market changes. Sure. So I think I'll start off with natural gas fragility. So I think there's a, a number of ways we could start looking at this question. But of course, being in Europe, the first one would be the energy crisis after Russia's invasion of Ukraine, which really kicked off this discussion about market design in Europe and you know, has led to these questions of, should we even have marginal pricing? Should we you know, scrap this and go back to a more kind of centrally planned system? And I'll echo Farhad's opening statements that, of course, this isn't this isn't a dichotomy so much as it's a spectrum of how much are we trying to do via a centralized process versus how much are we trying to use markets as a tool to achieve that same societal outcome. But for natural gas, I think we certainly saw that it can be hard to explain to politicians why are we talking about marginal pricing when it seems like wouldn't it be a great idea if we could just pay everybody you know, the cost that they bid into a market? But of course, um, you know, if you think about 
the strategy that each market participant has, their strategy would be to bid as high as they think the highest bid that would be cleared is. And what you end up with is a system that's more expensive, likely, than a system where you had that one uniform market clearing price in a uniform auction. But of course, at the same time, for natural gas, we truly had a supply shock, right? So, you know, the market was acting as the right messenger, that there was a scarcity of this resource. But how we handle that, I think, is a question bigger than just market design, right? Like the challenge was really trying to figure out how do you preserve the signal that this is a scarce resource and where we can, we need to reduce consumption and we need to, you know, preserve, uh, you know, preserve this resource for more extreme circumstances. But at the same time, you don't want to put shift a huge amount of burden to consumers to pay for a basic need like heating their homes. And so, you know, Europe tried to go through this process where the response was to cap revenues in the energy market in a way that tried to balance preserving the signal that there was a scarce resource and also preserving the incentive to invest in resources that are not natural gas. And so preserving the profitability of the resources that were on the system and available at the time, so sending a good signal in the long run, but at the same time had to figure out how do we transfer some of this you know, windfall profit back to consumers in this emergency situation. Can I ask uh, like two follow-ups, I think. Um, one is, is it reasonable to expect that in other markets where and I think in most markets currently natural gas is the marginal resource that will see some of those type of disruption, predictable to see disruption similar to Europe uh, in the future. Is that like a predictable thing? And and secondly, mm -hmm. is there is there a better way than capping revenues that you see as an alternative solution uh, than what Europe used? Is something mm -hmm. obvious that would be insightful? Yeah, so I think to the second question, I don't think there's something obvious that you can do in a time of crisis as great as this was, right? Like you really are balancing some competing objectives there. And I'm not sure that I could come up with something that was, you know, it's kind of a spectrum question. Was this the right point to cap revenues at? Was there another method that would have done a better job at preserving the scarcity signal while still allowing for consumers to have the help that they needed? Possibly. But as far as, you know, what might happen in the future, so when I think about, you know, the U.S. system, I, I, you know, remember hearing Emily's interview and I really resonated with the comment that a lot of these long-term planning models will assume that we have a small fraction of natural gas far into the future, when of course that is, you know, a resource that depends on having a network that's functioning to keep it available in those places. So that might be not be something we can depend on as much as we thought. Maybe that pushes us in slightly different directions about the kinds of you know, firm, low carbon, dispatchable resources that we develop or want to invest in now. Um, but, you know, certainly natural gas uh, is not something that is, uh, you know, ha has no risk to it, right? Texas, of course, saw that where the big underperformer was mostly the natural gas system in terms of being available when it was really needed during winter storm Uri. Yeah. Farha, do you want to jump in on this topic before we pivot yeah, to the next one? Any, any... Uh, Absolutely. You know, I, I'll I'll add one for context. Like insofar, and I love that you you listened to the episode. You really listened, Conley. You, uh, <laughs> uh, you are you do listen to Public Power Underground. Uh, like planning for the future. Insofar as there's this predictable thing that's gonna happen, is there any, anything that we can do in advance? Like in a crisis, we'll always manage a crisis. But is there anything like to think about in advance? Yeah. No. I, I think. Um, so I think. Um, one of the interesting things about um, these types of events, and and as we think about them, um, you know, it's, it's quite quite um, uh, common to kind of look at these as outlier events and sort of things that you know were not predictable and 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 you know the sort of um, one in a hundred year type event. Um, but one of the challenges with uh, electricity markets and and particularly electricity offer curves is the steepness of that curve means that you can change between a situation where you have a relative abundance of resources very quickly to um, a position where you're in, in quite a degree of scarcity. Um, it's it's in an off it's an in an offer curve of generation offers. It's called a knee point, where basically in, and it's quite apparent in in markets like Australia, where you have very strong price formation, is you the the um, 
the the change between um, um, prices that are you know more considered more reasonable and and prices that are considered extreme that 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 sort of band is is really small uh, and so you can get these very very big shifts and and this sort of goes into the the issue of of uh, what some call uh, fat tails or fat tailed events in in um, in probability and statistics and and these are um, uh, types of events that that of course are very hard to um, predict um, on an ex ante basis, but they do happen. Um, and, and we've seen you know a couple of examples um, recently across the world with with URI and and, and Europe. Um, but it, what when I take it to kind of um, Australia and, and my experience here, we've had um, in the last you know five or six years two periods with really extreme prices. So. These things do happen, um, and and they happen sort of consistently. So so we can't um, really ignore them, and, and sort of you know so so the more ahead planning and the more incentives that are aligned for this, um, the better. And and I think one of the things that um, I'm I'm pretty focused on is is trying to um, think about um, looking at this as almost like an insurance problem, where you have these extreme events, um, and in the same way that we you know, we look after our car and we drive it well, but we also insure for um, really extreme events. That's the same type of um, approach that we could in, adopt um, with electricity markets. Is is obviously we've got you know we've got um, the way of planning and, and running a portfolio for you know what we might call the regular operation, but we've got to then also have um, contingency plans and and backups and um, um, ways of dealing with um, of these types of events, and, and it could be on the demand side, it could be um, with with um, with storage or or generation or other assets, um, or or just building resilience through distributed resources. So I think those are all ways that we can we can start to think about um, protecting ourselves uh, for future events. Uh, some great foreshadowing, Farhad. Uh, I think it's time we can transition out of our first topic. Thanks, Conley, for giving us some in sites there and we can make it talk about some more uh so if we hit the typewriter and move to the next of the framing and as a reminder uh, we're trying to for cover these four elements of markets in transition uh using fat tails and increased exposure to extremes second batteries and price responsive demand third natural gas fragility and marginal pricing and four inverter driven resources and system security Conley started off with natural gas fragility using Europe as an example so Farhide which uh, which do you want to cover quickly next and uh, uh and take us with some news examples what do you got um so I'll, I'll maybe jump to um batteries uh price responsive demand and uh, and storage, um, and and I guess the way that so uh, in the electricity market we traditionally haven't had a lot of storage. Um, although I did I did spend a bit of time in before before this episode going and actually doing a bit of research on where some of the earliest storage um, facilities were, and most of them probably quite unsurprisingly are big pumped hydro storage units. Um, they tended to build be built around the 1960s and 70s, especially in Australia and, and potentially other markets as well. But um, and we, we count had, Farhad, right? Yeah. The Northwest counts with big hydro storage, <laughs> they have not just Absolutely. pumped hydro. Yep. And Norway probably counts, right, Almaz? Oh, You're sitting there in Norway with some yeah, big Absolutely. storage hydro. So we got, yeah, okay. Yeah, and, and many of these wants have been to get around, in on this like, game too. <laughs> yeah, get in on it. It's great. It's a beautiful way. But it does like. It does. Far I keep going on batteries because it is a new for a lot of markets to have this. Place. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's it's a new technology, and and also the 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 scale of storage is is something that's that's very different. So if we're going to envision a, a system with lots and lots and lots of wind and solar um, that's variable, that's intermittent, that sort of has has degrees of uncertainty associated with it, um, storage is is one part and a very important part of the suite of portfolio assets that we use to, to kind of firm up and, and provide balance for the system. But the other thing with, with batteries um, and, and storage is that they can also provide a variety of other roles in the system. So they can provide um, 
very fast frequency response. Um, they can provide um, voltage support. They can um, they can provide inertia, that, and and, I, um, and so they can do a variety of things. And, and folks tend to think of them, you know, we've heard the sort of the Swiss Army knife as being the 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 moniker for the battery. Um, um, but one one thing which I I, um, I sort of I think that the Swiss Army knife is is a useful analogy, but it's also um, not a perfect one because if you kind of just think about the Swiss Army knife, it's it's got a lot of capabilities, but maybe it does you know one or two things well. I think there's batteries, batteries can do quite a few things pretty well, but but they can't do it all at the same time. Um, you know you can you can potentially deliver certain forms of frequency response together, but um, you have a you have a finite um, inverter capacity that you're dealing with, so you you've got to be able to think about which services. Um, you enter into as well as the, the sort of the general energy storage um, service that that, um, that that batteries will provide. So, um, so the, the the way in which these units operate um, is 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 I think a, 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 you know we're still sort of quite quite early in in the understanding of of how these units are going to participate in in markets. And one of the things that that I think is really interesting is understanding the role of risk and risk aversion. Particularly on the operational side of things, um, because one of the one of the things that we saw um, about about um, a year or so ago with with the Australian market, um, when when the Australian market was essentially suspended for a period um, of about a week or two, um, was the challenge was not so much that we didn't have enough resources, was that the dispatch frameworks um, and particularly the the sort of the you know, the scarcity and the capping, it's almost like the circuit breakers of the system, were not as well catered to deal with energy limited plant because they had been designed to be to, to deal with um, with generation assets where there's there, you know there's an asset, ascent, an assumption that energy limits are, are not a big issue. But when 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 you've got a high, a high um, penetration of, of assets that are energy limited, it introduces a lot of questions around how you how you create these sort of um, circuit breaker frameworks to ensure that you know you still have a, a viable operating system, um, and and particularly yeah. that role of risk I think is is really important to that. Yeah, one of the observations uh, California had an extreme event and they were at their price cap uh, for some period of time. Um, and batteries got deployed on the first day of that energy emergency when it hit a price cap, they got deployed right away. Probably not the period of most need, um, the, but it was at the cap, so why not just take advantage yep. of it? I think that's a fascinating mm -hmm. uh, problem. Uh, Conley, so in the Pacific Northwest, we're transitioning from this bilateral market, which uh, we have a lot of storage resources, and I think the bilateral has kind of incorporated that type of resource into the way it works in the Northwest. Uh, Europe has some hydro storage. It also has a market. Any mm -hmm. insights on this type of topic uh, that you'd bring to bear on that could apply to batteries? Yeah, so I mean, Europe's an interesting case in, in some ways because a lot of, you know, so Switzerland, for instance, has a huge storage resource and is in a lot of ways quite a hub physically in Europe. But, you know, because of the way that the markets are designed here, you know, we're not necessarily in all those conversations about future market design because of Switzerland's role outside of the EU and its relationship with Europe, and also because of how zonal pricing in Europe works, right? So there are these contracts, but you also have things that zonal pricing doesn't necessarily catch in terms of, you know, when congestion is arising and kind of where and when energy is actually most valuable, right? That signal doesn't necessarily always come through. And I think that's an interesting thing to, to think about in relationship to the Northwest, right? Where you did have, when you had this injection of a lot more renewables, well, what happened empirically is that a short run, you know, real time market developed, right? And that that was the way that it was the most efficient to handle incorporating those resources. Yeah, Almaz, did you have any follow up or should we get to the next one? We, we can keep it moving. Okay, we got, I got the clock going to make sure we keep, we're, we're trying to hit 20 minutes. We're a little bit over. It's going to be great, though. Uh, why don't you, we'll hit the typewriter and post. Take it away, Almaz. All right. 
with Handbook on Electricity Markets and PL Joss goes from hierarchies to markets and partially back again in electricity, colon, responding to decarbonization and security of supply goals as background. So those two works uh, in background. We've covered two of the four topics we intended to cover. Uh, Conley, can you give us your hot takes on fat tails and increased exposure to extremes in two minutes or less? Sure, I'll give it a shot. So if we think about an ideal central planner designing what resources to invest in and how to operate those resources, and we compare that to a perfectly competitive market with marginal pricing, we make some assumptions that aren't necessarily true in reality, and we figure out what are the optimality conditions for both of these things, and they're equivalent. And so we can say, in theory, that this the central planner should come up with the same decision as the market solution should. So Let's kind of think about what happens in reality, though, because especially when we inject risk into the equation, I think that becomes really difficult to um, to say that the two are likely to be equivalent anymore. So if we're thinking about an energy only market, right, where the prices are allowed to spike as high as they would need to to provide investment cost recovery for all resources, we have this issue of do you really want to make an investment decision based off of something that is a very improbable event? Right. So, you know, even something that is not necessarily wholly unlikely to happen again, like Texas had a winter storm in 2011 as well, in which, you know, you might say, OK, prices were very high. This should have incentivized resources to be available in anticipation of a storm like this again. But, you know, there's a cost to making your equipment be able to operate in those conditions that were, you know, rare extreme weather event in Texas. And, you know, maybe you think of this a bit like, would you take out health insurance as an 18 year old versus would you take out health insurance as a 65 year old if you weren't made to, right? And one of those, it's maybe an easier sell than another, the way it's an easier sell for, you know, plants in Wisconsin to weatherize their equipment. And so when we're thinking about using markets as a tool to procure resource adequacy, essentially for extreme events, that becomes a little bit difficult, right? Um, and, uh, yeah, I'd love to hear Farhad's take on this as well, because I think the the insurance idea of this is really interesting, right? But it's also probably very hard to insure against extreme weather events that are happening across a very wide geographic area simultaneously. Yeah, Farhad, are we, so we all know the peak time to buy insurance is when you have a mortgage and kids. And so I'm, I'm like in the peak, it's easy to sell me insurance because I've got a bunch of obligations uh and yeah uh is, are we is the grid at the peak acquisition of insurance time is this the the period where we should be focused on it the most well i think and i think i guess um probably to the corollary to that is the worst time to buy insurance is when your house is burning which is yeah. a lot of the time that's when we tend to think of you know the, the sort of insurance or i wish i had insurance or i wish i kind of did this and i think i think it look to, to, to kind of be um, upfront about the issue, um, it is a really complicated and a really difficult issue because you're dealing with these sort of extremes um, and you're dealing with these things that don't happen too often, but you know when they do happen, boy, they really have a big impact on the system. So they're not easy to, to kind of price, but I think one of the things that, um, certainly in, in, in my reading of, of things is that there are markets that, that start to do that, right? I mean, there are global capital markets for insurance, for reinsurance um, that look at, you know, weather events that are, you know, three, four, five times uh, standard deviations from, from sort of normality. And, um, you know, there are, techniques to be able to 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 adopt to look at some of these things and particularly around the capital formation um and and how much reserve you hold in the system i think there's that that in that starts to impose a, a slightly different discipline than than um so it's again it's i guess it's probably saying that we're not we're not at a point where you could just say yep um, but just by sort of thinking about it as an insurance yep we've got all the answers but it starts to create a different framework for assessing risk um, and, and particularly those sort of extreme risks that 
um, you know, these one in a hundred year hap um, events that keep happening every couple of years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then I think there's the question of what of these extreme events do we think is something we could use maybe an insurance mechanism like the one Farhad is proposing to prepare for versus what events maybe have to become in the US context, a NERC or a FERC regulatory standard? Uh, and is it fair, like we expect, that, like we discuss them as tail events and they are tail events, they're extreme cases, but we do expect them to become more frequent. Is that fair? Yes, I think that's fair. You know, this is something that we know about climate change is that it is very likely to increase the frequency and severity of these extreme weather events. But then the question is still, you know, even if something is a one in 10 year event, you know, do you take that into account when you're thinking about investing in a resource or is that still too rare or yeah. too uncertain that it wouldn't be part of your investment thought process? And yeah. in the extreme, are the, is the extreme case becoming more extreme? Like not only is it the rare things happening more frequently, but the rare things that are happening more frequently are more extreme. Is that fair? Yeah, and I, and I think the other thing that's, um, that's sort of an additional wrinkle in this is that um, these events are typically sort of what they call compound or uh, you know, compound type events where, uh, or cascading events was the other word, um, where you know something happens and that triggers something else and that sort of you know triggers something else and because we're dealing with large scale infrastructure across you know electricity but also the fuel markets that are you know the coal and the gas traditionally um markets that are seemingly connected by physical infrastructure um sometimes these events can you know impact a range of these these different infrastructures um and so um you know thinking about it in that context i mean that that i think is one of the um, um, highlighted weaknesses of um, sort of traditional RA mechanisms like capacity markets and the like is, you know, we've sort of got this standard, you know, one year, uh, one day um, in 10 year uh, standard, I believe in, in the US. I mean, one event sometimes, one uh, event in 10 years, so hmm. not necessarily a whole day. And so I think, I think those are, I mean, again, I'd, I'd be really interested to understand how we came up with that sort of Rule yeah, of thumb. me too. Actually. But, you know, I, I guess w what I'm saying is that, you know, again, that it, it doesn't mean that you can predict these things or you can get all these things right. But um, you start to think about not just frequency, but you also kind of link it with severity. And I think that's potentially the missing link at the moment in, in many um, discussions on RAs, that sort of extremity. Um, we think about, you know, we think about likelihood, but but we've got to think about impact as well. I totally agree. And I think for now, it no longer makes sense to think about resource adequacy as a single metric, because yes, okay, we historically have inherited this heuristic one event in 10 year standard. But of course, you know, when an actual blackout occurs, suddenly we're all very upset about it, even though it was maybe with a frequency of even less than one in 10 years. But because that standard doesn't really reflect what the underlying consumer utility function is, right? It's like at the end of the day, we have some amount of electricity that is for essential services that we value much more greatly than the electricity to you know, heat a swimming pool, for instance. But the way that things work right now is we're not necessarily able to do you know, differential curtailment of those kinds of loads. And that's something maybe that we will be able to do with more advanced smart grid, smart metering technology in the future. And, you know, that would be a big help, right? If you had a winter storm URI and you didn't have to say, all right, we're indiscriminately having a blackout here or a blackout here, but saying, okay, we're able to, you know, turn everybody down by a certain amount that still allows essential services to, to be online. I'm not sure how many other utilities, and I know, uh, you know, uh, in the, the Northwest, folks are moving away from single resource adequacy metrics and just the probability. Tacoma, we, um, I want to say it was four years ago, we moved to um, three metrics for our resource adequacy, and they all have to be satisfied for us to be resource adequacy. Mm -hmm. and we look at um, frequency, duration, and magnitude of, of outages, um, because all, all three of those are, are actually important. But 
uh, yeah, I, I don't know how we 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 managed to uh, maybe it's a legacy of the of our of a fossil fuel um, system uh, that it had different needs, but yeah, I don't know how we got with the, the the metrics of the past. A, a yeah. heuristic, I love that word. <laughs> reminds me of right, our friend Russ Man Manifel, who may listen. Uh, go ahead, Conley. Oh, sorry. Yeah, no, I agree. It's a heuristic because it's not based on an economic analysis, right? Like we didn't come up with this because we think that this is related to the value of loss load. And of course, there isn't right. a single value of loss load either. Right. That's why, you know, in the future, if you're able to rely on an active demand side setting the price more frequently rather than this administratively determined value of loss load or price cap, that helps with this problem, right? It does ameliorate this issue a little bit. Um, but yeah, moving forward, I think, you know, resource adequacy is, is a question not of just the historical, you know, when we, we say one event in 10 years, because historically this analysis was based on a daily peak. Did you hit it? Did you not hit it? Right. Binary thing. And, you know, you determine the likelihood that you would hit it or not hit it based on a convolution of forced outage rates of thermal units, which were seen as independent. But of course, you know, as France saw, when you have all of your nuclear plants from, you know, similar designs, you're not necessarily going to have maintenance happen randomly amongst them. That might be correlated. And of course, weather is going to be that common variable that is influencing outage rates in so many cases. And so like that historical way of doing resource adequacy calculations is definitely not what we need to use moving forward. Right. I think that's, I, I... 100% agree with that. I think one of the, the big unanswered questions at the moment, um, though we're seeing some really interesting data on this, is whether a grid with a different mix, right, with, with sort of high renewables penetration is more or less resilient than a thermal dominated grid. Um, mm -hmm. And we, you know, one argument is, well, that it's going to be less because you've got all this variability and the like. The other argument also is that you could really benefit from essentially a, um, a shift away from sort of these common mode linkages between assets to, mm -hmm. um, you know, for example, when we had um, the, we sort of had an, in, when Europe had its crisis last year, Australia was also experiencing major flooding um, to get, we, we saw high gas prices, but also major flooding in, um, in the regions where there was a lot of coal. So the coal train started to, you know, get impacted in logistic challenges. So, you know, they rely on, you know, physical infrastructure. There's, you know, there's sort of common linkages between the supply chains. So if you mm -hmm. have something that's potentially fun, you know, has fundamentally different drivers, is that a better thing? Um, you know, there's, there's one argument to suggest that it could be a, a good diversifier. Um, and of course, it's, it's hard to diversify these sort of tail events, but, this is potentially one because the fundamental basis might be really different here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this this kind of reminds me of the discussion between having a more centralized system versus a more distributed system, right? So maybe one in which you have more microgrids that can island themselves in extreme weather events or especially to be resilient to extreme weather events. Maybe, you know, if you have the local resources there, you can recover more quickly, for instance. And, you know, like all things, right, it is very much, you know, a portfolio approach where probably either of the extreme is not the most efficient thing, right? It's somewhere in the middle. And so, you know, that's likely true for, you know, resource adequacy in the future is, you know, un unlikely to be served by a few resources, but, you know, quite a large basket of different resources that have different comparative advantages at different times. Oh, that was a great transition because we're going to do some fan service because one of the things about those big central generators is they provide a lot of inertia to the grid. <laughs> so where we've talked about, we've talked about fat tail and increased exposure to extremes. We've talked about batteries and responsive uh, demand. We talked about natural gas fragility and marginal pricing. So we're down to our last topic, which is these, these resources that are a lot of new inverter driven resources and its impact on system security. And there's one example in Australia of them adding some synchronous generators to add some inertia to the grid um, to about make sure you have like stable frequencies and voltages. Uh, Farhad, can you, can you, well, 
somebody has already hit the typewriter in post. They they picked up my signals uh, when I was celebrating for being so excited <laughs> about the fan service and the great transition. Can you pick us up there and talk about uh, inverter based systems and the need? Sure, for maybe sure. Some more so, inertia? so the 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 last bastion of the the synchronous resource. Um, so. One of the things that I thought was was really cool when I started to learn about system security um, a few years ago was the the interaction between you know the the physical and the mechanical and the electrical system and and inertia is one great example and for for folks that may not have the the background here um, essentially um, one of the most important elements of keep a, keeping a power system secure and not having the lights go off is ensuring that frequency um, is the frequency of the electricity system is sort of managed within um, operating bounds. Um, and one of the things that you know was sort of um, hidden in the value that synchronous generation, these big heavy spinning things, um, would by their very weight and mass slow down any disturb you know the impacts of any disturbance so the um the rate of change of frequency or what you know we like to call in the industry the rock off would be much slower in a system with a lot of inertia well, relative to one with without and and obviously the issue with now the with the first generation of invert of wind and solar and I'll I'll say first generation because that's really important is the way in which the first generation of wind and solar um interacts with the grid is that it's it has an inverter and the inverter um, you know couples basically takes the voltage signal from the grid and uses that to synchronize and 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 to provide um, essentially grid compatible taking from DC um, electricity to grid compatible AC um, and so it actually relied on um, the character it relied essentially on a stable grid both for voltage and frequency um, now. That reliance is starting to change as we get into these really advanced inverters. So, you know, we, we thought that it was only synchronous generation and synchronous condensers that could provide things like inertia and, and system strength. But as we get, you know, the technology is advancing so quickly and, and the research is advancing so quickly is that um, we're now able to, you know, see, um, you know, pretty good results in terms of the ability of these new inverter-based resources to deliver the types of services that we, we need and really the full scope of services that we, we may need. So um, we still need inertia and we still at the moment probably still need big spinning things in our system. Um, but again, it, with, with advanced technology, that, you know, that assumption could be, could be broken in, in a pretty short space of time. Um, obviously, the big missing picture here is the incentives. So, for something to deliver inertia, why why would I calibrate my inverter to do all these cool things and deliver in inertia and system strength if I don't have any, if I don't make any money from it? Why would I do it? Um, or if I don't lose, you know, not lose money from it? Um, so, that's where the the idea, you know, that's where the issue of you know market and regulatory design and and frameworks for those essential system services come into being. Um, Can I ask a like a tweak this a little bit? So, so Australia is installing some synchronous uh, condensers to provide some of these uh, system security attributes. I, 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 th I think that's why they're doing it. Uh, yeah. Having just they're read in. the articles, yeah. but yeah. But is there something about Australia's market design that's providing that price signal for those, or is this a regulatory we're we're going to just do it uh, kind of uh, it's, assertion? It was is this the more ladder. of the NERC uh, framework or a market? Oh, it's a ladder. Yeah, so it was a ladder because the the issue actually. So um, back when I I joined AMO in 2016, um, but the first rate, you know, these issues were first raised really a number of years ago, um, and so the the problem was that. We're starting to see, we saw this huge shift, particularly in South Australia, which is where these syncons came in. And what we found was we were starting to, you know, curtail resources. We were starting to have to um, recommit um, synchronous generation that would ordinarily have not been in the market. So basically directing those units on um, gas generation primarily. Mm -hmm. um, and so what the regular, regulator essentially did, and that was primarily for system strength, but it also had inertial capability, was to say, hey, 
regulated network, transmission network, can you just please, can you install these things? Um, because they provide uh, system strength for us to be able to operate a inverted dominated grid in South Australia. Um, now, um, I'm not sure where the, the, the most recent guidance is, but as we added more and more of those SYNCONs, and I think there's four in total, the reliance on having to recommit gas generator or direct gas generators on um, has reduced. And, and I don't know whether we've completely eliminated it at this point, I'll, I'll have to check that, but um, certainly that ability to operate in, in sort of an islanded mode even. Um, and, and South Australia had a really interesting example about a few months ago where they actually were um, disconnected from the rest of Australia and were operating a predominantly uh, renewable plus gas grid. And, and so that was, you know, a very early and short test case, but for it was a good, good period of a few weeks where they were kind of running, um, running as an island um, and managing both for, for reliability and, and security. And I remember hearing the news story of when South Australia last year had a storm and was disconnected from the rest of the grid and then suddenly had to send out these alerts you know, please use as much power as you can because we have all of these non-controllable distributed resources from the rooftop solar that we're not able to turn down, right? And so this is this question of, you know, what's happening in South Australia really forces this question of, you know, we probably need a lot more, uh, you know, active demand side. We need, you know, the ability to respond quickly to changes in the grid. So, you know, this question of for batteries, you know, what is that future market going to look like? Because of course we don't need inertia per se. Like when we talk about synthetic inertia, we're really talking about very fast frequency response. And, you know, if you can change the, uh, you know, amount you're producing very quickly, that is a substitute for that, you know, but will there be a market for that someday? What will that look like? It has, you know, if you have a, a fast frequency response market, that's going to have kind of downstream effects on some of these other power system um, security constraints as well. And then is that something that investors and batteries can count on now or anticipate? Or, you know, is that future ancillary services market revenue still something that's very, you know, uncertain in terms of these investment decisions? I think we, we don't have the answers to that just yet. And for regions with a lot of clean synchronous big synchronous generators with a lot of inertia are they going to be compensated for that attribute that they're providing to uh grids with a lot of inverter based resources like e even if uh you wouldn't maybe the maybe they won't get new investment in uh in these technologies in the northwest because we already have like these big beautiful synchronous uh clean generators uh is there market mechanisms to compensate those resources for this very valuable service that would need to be met by new investment if it weren't for uh, these be big, beautiful hydro resources. Don't we have big, beautiful hydro resources, Almaz, that rotate really nice and clean with probably just a bunch of beautiful inertia, don't they, Almaz? It's they're great. The, they're literally the perfect resource. I mean, they are perfect. They are perfect. As close to perfect as you can get. How about that? Yeah, I'll, I don't know. I don't even know if they're as close to perfect as you can get, but um, they're still, they're really good. They're clean and they're heavy they and they a rotate. Good feeling. Yeah. Yeah, a good feeling. I love a good synchronous generator that's spinning. I have physics of rotation. Uh, I don't know, technology, synthetic inertia. I'm a little skeptical, but that's because I don't have to worry too much about it. Uh, I think I think we covered that, and I got to have a rant about inertia, uh, uh, which I appreciate. Thank you all for letting me do that. But we're going to move on and hit the typewriter, and then I got a wonky energy game that we're going to test out. Everybody ready? Yep. Yep. Okay, so we have world-renowned experts on two topics, long-run optimal pricing on electric markets with non-convex costs. Conley is our world-renowned expert on that topic, and a reliable a reliability insurance overlay on energy only electricity markets far hot world renowned experts on the reliability insurance overlay so i came with a game cuz i want you to to show off how awesome you are in these topics um the 
experts so far had and Conley um, have a Twitter video length amount of time to describe their topics. That's about two minutes and 20 seconds. You can do it in less. The algorithm will, uh, be will benefit us if you do it in less. Then the rest of us compete to regurgitate that concept back in a paragraph or less in the best, most succinct way possible. Um, we're using analogies, examples, memes, uh, underscoring why it matters, and, and why and we're encouraged to do this in a TikTok length response, which is 34 seconds. And I've got a timer. Um, so the experts, after we go through this game, I, I tried to come up with like, can you can you actually award us with something? I came up with something open to corrections. This is our first time running it. But the experts will then decide if who gets the hashtag energy Twitter wonkiness crowd to someone who while it was the least decipherable response was at least correct so terribly indecipherable but correct gets a wonkiness crown <laughs> or a TikTok bards marote which is something like a scepter but a jester's marote to the explanation that is it's it's correct but also infotaining <laughs> and we're calling the game of course, I understand. That's why I'm not saying anything and why I'm nodding my head this whole time. Oh, you mean you want me to translate this incredibly wonky topic to someone outside of energy Twitter? Sure, of course. I guess I can try. Also, the name needs some tweaking, but let's be honest, it's five in the morning. Uh, I probably didn't deliver it the best. So uh, Farhad, we're gonna start with you. Um, and then we're, we're, we'll go around and we're, we're all gonna have to translate it. So everybody be ready with your translation, thinking about the way to make this make sense for the most people. But Farhad, can you explain, and I'm gonna hit the timer in two minutes and 20 seconds, I'm hitting it now, two minutes and 20 seconds or less, a reliability insurance overlay on energy only electric markets. Are you ready? I'm ready. Start. <laughs> All right, so I wish I had a great meme um, to start off with, but I don't. So I'm just actually gonna talk about the, the, the core issue which we're trying to address, which is this issue um, um, of what we call incomplete markets. Essentially, um, as, as Connolly had highlighted before, um, if you have a, uh, an energy market with, with a strong um, energy price, um, in theory, you should be able to get um, investment that is efficient and, and optimal. Um, but there are practical factors, there are issues associated with those markets that make them not perfect, essentially. And so um, what tends to happen is that you have um, additional overlays, where they call them resource adequacy overlays on markets, that um, ensure that the, um, the level of investment is, is sufficient to actually meet um, reliability requirements. Um, and traditionally this is done kind of via a very administrative process. You might have a centrally determined, um, or someone sent, you know, centrally determined agency that says, hey, we think that we need to calibrate um, the additional amount of generation that we procure as being you know, X, X hundred megawatts or X gigawatts. Um, and the challenge with that is that the incentives for that public agency um, are not actually very sharp. Um, they're indirect. Um, whether they get it right or not is, is it's, you know, it's kind of, it's a bit more like a, a sort of a government. Um, there's not um, the full degree of accountability that you may expect from a financial perspective. And so the idea here is to really introduce a financial domain to the sort of tail risk um, um, analysis and tail risk management by basically create instead of having a an administrative capacity market, if you will, you essentially create an insurance agency that um, prices these extreme events. So it essentially looks at the market um, and essentially tries to provide um, a price for which they would be willing to insure those extreme events. Did I make it in okay. time? Okay, you yeah. did great. You did great. Uh, absolutely great. Uh, Conley, we're going to start with you. I'm going to put the timer to 34 seconds. Can you okay. interpret what Farhad said in 34 seconds or less? Ready? Go. 
Generators often cannot recover capital costs via energy only markets because prices aren't high enough or there is risk aversion and so we're under procuring resource adequacy. Instead of a central procurement mechanism, you could instead use a reliability differentiated insurance framework that has the benefit of allowing consumers to choose their reliability level um, more specifically and has an economic incentive for that insurer to not under or over procure resources. Oh, that was perfect. You, it's like you had your own timer. That was awesome. Okay, Amaz, you're up. You ready? On your mark, get set, do it. Okay, I understood that markets are incomplete um, and I'm reading into what you said, but um, they're not very good at um, ensuring public goods. And so we often have a government entity that will provide those public goods, sort of like resource adequacy. Um, but what you're, but they tend to be more you know, inefficient. And so a solution to the incompleteness of the market is to have sort of this um, finance, the insurance. Um, um, uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. How, how, how'd she do? I, do I, I think I need to go. I wasn't sure I didn't write myself going into this, but why not? We'll try it. Okay. On my mark, get set, go. Okay. I can't help of thinking Farhad's reliability insurance in terms of airlines and airports and how we manage, uh, manage that system. So Dr. Kyrie Breaker has this idea of bidding for your seat on the plane, uh, similar to like when the airline wants to uh, have less passengers, you can go on, figure out what price not to ride. So the reliability insurance overlay is like, instead you get to pay to make sure that the plane is reliable enough to your satisfaction to get to your destination. <laughs> that cut me off. I'm uh, there sorry. was more to that, but that's 34 seconds. Calm, calmly that, was really going for it there. that was really going for it there. Okay, Farhad, you got an award. Which is the wonkiest correct answer, but maybe we should do like it's it's maybe not as 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 clear and correct. Okay, so I think for for wonkiness, um, I think I'm gonna have to go with Conley. Okay, you're getting the crown, Conley. I did. I was gonna come up with a crown, and and I didn't. I ran out of time, but maybe maybe in the future I'll get a crown. Okay, and and who's getting the Bard's Marot? Um, so I think. Paul, with your plain analogy, I think it was really enthusiastic. Um, uh, and I think I'm going to have to give you that one just for that enthusiasm. Okay, I'm the court well jester done. of this game, that's for sure. Uh, well um, okay, uh, up next, we're going to go with uh, Conley. You are the you are the world-renowned experts on long-run optimal pricing and electric markets with non-convex costs. Okay, so in two minutes and 20 seconds or less, can you give us an explanation? Earlier, we talked about the missing money problem resulting from prices not rising high enough in energy markets due to external factors like price caps or risk aversion. However, even if we allowed for sufficiently high scarcity prices and assume every actor is risk neutral, marginal pricing would not necessarily lead to long run cost recovery or even short run cost recovery because electricity markets are non convex. Non-convex pricing is sometimes called fast start pricing in US ISOs. And an easy way to see an example of this is just to think about a fast start block loaded unit that can either be turned on or turned off. That unit can never set the marginal cost. The marginal price is set by the least expensive generator that does have room to ramp up or down, but that price may be less expensive than that block loaded unit's variable cost. If the unit has a startup cost, it would also not recover its short run fixed cost. We want to find a price that is efficient, meaning that it maximizes social welfare and no market participant would, be, would do better by unilaterally deviating from the dispatch decision. Because of non-convex costs, no uniform price exists that can clear the market and support the social welfare maximizing centralized dispatch decision. There are a number of non-convex pricing methods, and they all involve resolving the system operator's problem while relaxing the constraint that units have to be turned on or turned off. They also provide a side payment to at least compensate for short-run losses. One method used in the New York ISO fixes the commitment decisions to the optimal values previously found and changes the minimum operating level to zero for a subset of online units. Another method used in the Mid-Continent ISO fixes the commitment decisions of all but a subset of online units. 
However, prices are not meant to only be a signal to efficiently operate the system in the short run, but also a signal for optimal entry and exit decisions in the long run. If we think about this problem in the long run, and especially if we include price responsive demand, there can be large differences in these methods in terms of what consumers pay for the same reliability level. I find that a method called convex hole pricing outperforms methods currently in use by upwards of 20% in some case studies. Getting prices right will be important for signaling optimal retirement decisions of fossil fuel resources and entry of new low carbon resources. The non-convex pricing problem may also continue to be important if new technologies that come online are best modeled with integer variables. How are we doing on the time? You did great. Oh my, okay, you, great. You, yeah, you had nine <laughs> seconds left. That's I mean, perfect. I might've tried to plan that, so. <laughs> you did, I can tell. Yeah. I love preparation. <laughs> Big fan of preparation, actually. <laughs> okay, so uh, Farhad, we're starting with you this time. I'm gonna put it for 34 seconds and then and then you're gonna go, okay? Ready, uh, All right. go. So uh, non-convexity is a challenge in uh, pricing uh, of electricity markets because um, marginal pricing cannot um, guarantee um, uh, necessarily revenue adequacy and, and budget balance, balancedness. So um, what we're trying to do is essentially because of the presence of non-convex resources, create a, uh, a pricing mechanism um, that can, um, that actually provide, that, that um, allows you to achieve as best um, those characteristics as possible. Um, and, and I think um, the key outcome of this analysis was that. <laughs> Keep going, get, get, just give me the last All word. Right. The key outcome of that was. <laughs> the key, the... You can't count this, Conley, as part the, of your judging, but we can include it for, for the our key, listeners. Yeah. Um, so the, the key out, outcome of that was there's a pricing rule which, um, which allows you to, to, to approximate um, investment efficiency pretty well. That's called convex okay. hull pricing. Convex hull pricing. H U L L. Mm -hmm. I learned that. Uh, the first time I heard it, I thought it was W H O L E, but it's hull. H U L L. Ah. <laughs> yes. So I, I, yes. I learned that in reading your paper. Thank you for uh, sharing that. Amaz, you're up next. 35 seconds. Ready? Go. All right. Let's try. Um, very simply, because of the, the very blocky um, nature of certain resources costs, it's imp impossible for resources to recover their costs through marginal pricing alone. Um, and there has to be another way for us to approximate those costs in marginal pricing. And to the extent that we can do that, um, it'll be better for um, decisions, uh, investment decisions uh, moving forward. Uh, and um, you know, retirement decisions as well. That was amazing, Almaz. You still had four seconds yeah. left. Because I didn't say uh, everything she said. Well, no, <laughs> of course, that's the whole game. That's the whole game. You don't say everything they say, but you try to figure out like how to say it. Okay, ready? I'm going to try. I'm going to try this. Yeah. Okay. The way I think about convex versus non-convex pricing is like a slinky going down the stairs. If you got convex <laughs> pricing, you got it's a slinky on uh, an escalator it works fine but all the stairs are the same length it works fine convex pricing works great but our actual system is like a slinky trying to go down different size stairs and in order to solve for that you got to figure out these like mechanisms like a, a like a, an arm that kind of like kicks it down to the next stair and keeps it going um and in order to solve for that and and, and make marginal price decisions <laughs> I don't know. You got to have this extra arm that's like clearing it down the stairs. That's I'm how not I thought about get it. The image of the slinky coming down the stairs out of my head. The slinky now. coming down the stairs. I Convex markets is just like the slinky works down the escalator. It's just awesome. But we don't have a slinky in it or normal size stairs. Oh, anyway, wow. Paul, oh, that was great. <laughs> I think this is like that's, here for. that's what I'm here for. Uh, Conley, you got to award. You got to award the crown. Who's the wonkiest? Uh, and correct, but also somewhat opaque. All right. So I guess if we're disqualifying poor Farhad for time constraints there, I guess we got to give the wonkiness crown to Almaz. And uh, Paul, how could you not win the TikTok version with the slinky, which I think I maybe uh, will have to animate and put in a slide someday. Yes. Uh, thank you. That's what I'm here for. I, uh... That's what I'm here for. I'm the interpreter. I'm the I'm the court jester. Let's be honest. Okay, <laughs> thank you for that. Any follow up on that? Because these are really fun and interesting topics regarding not just the game, but any and Conley. Any questions for Farhad? Farhad, any questions or follow up for Conley? We um, can get them what, in because these are really uh, cool topics. 
Yeah, I mean, this is this was um, a great paper, and I, I, I loved reading it because it was. I think it kind of gets to the heart of you know the prob the, the the real challenges of, of pricing. The one question I had for you was in as we move to these you know essentially markets with more and more zero cost renewables, mm -hmm. you know, um, low marginal cost storage, and less uh, and less aware, and we move away from these sort of big spinning units that are more con you know, non convex in nature. Does it is it sort of become less relevant, or does it become more relevant where it kind of becomes the you know the tail wags the dog kind of situation? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I had the same question, which is why there's a follow up paper looking at this subject. Um, and so, you know, I think that was motivated in part by seeing another analysis that was saying, okay, if we're going to have a lot more variable renewables on the system, will flexibility providers be able to recover their costs adequately, right? Like, are we supporting them well via this pricing system? And what I didn't like about that analysis was that it thought about it in the short run. If you just chuck a bunch more wind on a system and you ask, do these resources still recover their costs? Well, of course, some of them don't because some of them ought to be pushed out in the long run. But what I found was that if you allow a system to adapt, that extra profit that producers are getting because of the non-convexities, because we don't have this perfect corollary to marginal pricing in the non-convex context, that extra profit per producer is somewhat consistent and doesn't necessarily decrease or get worse, right? You could think that maybe it would get worse if you have units that are cycling on and off more often and doing things that result in these non-convexities. But what I find is that if you allow the system to adapt in the long run, that's not so much the issue. And it really is much more, um, you know, so that might be an issue in during the transition, right? Before these units retire, I think you will see that happening more often where the, the non-convexities become more of an issue. As a price signal though, I don't think that's necessarily uh, your problem, but um, if you think that we're going to have a lot less resources that need to be modeled with non-convexities because that producer profit per resource is somewhat similar, as long as it's long run adapted, you know, even if you have a lot more variable renewables, what you would see though is that from the consumer's perspective, it matters less to you, right? If there's some producers where maybe you're paying them more inframarginal rent than you otherwise would, um, if it was a convex system, but they're only a really small part of the system, then yes, it's not as big an issue. But if you think in the future, maybe we want to model a lot of resources with integer variables, and if there was significant cost associated with some of those integer decisions, then the problem could persist in the future. But I think it's largely a kind of transition question. And it would be a way of saying, you know, if you had a thermal resource that said, you know, I'm critical for flexibility and I'm not being adequately compensated because of these non-convexity issues and non-convex pricing, well, you could use this research to say, well, you know, you probably are just being signaled to exit the market in the long run. And, you know, that's just the nature of the transition. You are going to have signals to exit as well as signals to enter. Yeah, I wanted that's... in in reading through the paper, it sounded like there is a couple markets that use something like the convex hull uh, marginal pricing calculation. I don't know the right words for it, um, but you used in your paper an example of MISO's extended LMP as doing a worse job than the convex mm -hmm. hull solution. Can you talk about yeah. um, which markets actually use this technique and and how maybe MISO's technique's different, but still better sure. than nothing, it, maybe it sounded like? Sure. So no no market uses full convex hull pricing right now. And part of that is it's because- it's too hard to solve, right? It used to be, computation right? We, we, okay, we used ahead. to think that that getting exact convex hull prices would be too computationally intensive, but there's a great okay. recent paper out there using, maybe we could link it in the show notes, using dancing wolf decomposition to find exact convex hull prices efficiently, quickly um, on a system as large as PJM. So what I would say is that it's not the computational tractability that's the problem anymore. It was in the past, but we've also okay. shown in the past that we can approximate convex hull prices pretty well and still get most of these properties. So I think the question is more now, do we want to use it? You know, there's no free lunch in this question. Like there are downsides to convex hull pricing too, but it's just a question okay. of, do we think that the benefits outweigh the downsides? And I think they probably do. Um, for what the mid-continent ISO is doing. So yes, you might think of it as being partial convex hull pricing in that what they've done 
if you want to think of like a very approximation to convex hull pricing would be simply to say, relax the binary variables, like this commitment decision of being on and off and resolve the problem. And so what the mid-continent okay. ISO is doing is they're doing that relaxation, but only for a subset of units. So, you know, it could be the subset of units uh, that are online or like an even smaller subset of units that are online. But what that does is it means that the convex hull prices are not influenced by units that are currently offline, which means that those units are going to see higher lost opportunity costs. And what I find is that that price that you settle on for the partial convex hull pricing is often too high, right? Like if we're thinking about just trying to get as close to cost recovery, but not too much extra producer profit in the long run in the, you know, in the system adapted to that market, you know, consumers would prefer that you have less excess profit, right? And that the partial convex hull yep. pricing gives you too much excess profit to some of those intramarginal units. Okay. And that and that's only in the day ahead, right? Like, because um, mm -hmm. I'm just contrasting it to, to the Australian market, which actually um, adopts essentially what's called self-commitment. So we don't have, mm -hmm. um, we don't have a day ahead market. Um, and um, it is essentially, the problem is essentially internalized to the resource. So you, if you're a resource owner, you then decide whether to commit that, that unit or not. Um, and so mm -hmm. the costs of startup um, are essentially internalized and, and essentially then priced in, in, into your offers, um, which, which has had some different implications for, for, for example, the, 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 uh, the, um, um, the large coal units because their inflexibility has meant that um, where other more flexible units could switch off during the solar noon, um, they've had to ride through those. And, and, and obviously that means that they're, they're taking losses um, mm -hmm. with, with, with riding and paying for that inflexibility. So um, it's, yeah. it's, yeah, it's just, I always like to contrast this sort of, you know, centralized unit commitment um, world with, you know, kind of what we've, we've had operating in, in, in the NEM for a while of, you know, sort of decentralized um, or self self commitment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's yeah, and I think that's an it's an interesting distinction, right? Because if we thought about okay, if our job as the system operator, the market designer, is we're trying to maximize not just social welfare but consumer welfare at the end of the day, and we think about okay, if I tell everyone, give me all of your constraints, I solve a centralized problem, and then I derive prices from it. That's sort of the problem that was being explored in this paper. Right. Yeah. But an alternative would be to say, OK, I'm not going to know all of your internal constraints. You just take your best guess, you know, at what you think, you know, a price that you would still be profitable, you know, and that's worth it for you to bid. Right. And so what that does, though, is it means that the solution you're going to clear in a market like that is not the same solution as you would if it was centralized. The operator, you know, has all this information and is finding that social welfare maximizing dispatch decision. We're not getting the social welfare maximizing dispatch decision if we ask everyone to internalize those non-convexities themselves. But you might think that, you know, it's maybe not so much lower that you know, you're too concerned about it, you know, and that's just a choice you have to make and you have to kind of weigh up how much do you think this welfare loss is. Um, and, you know, the way that Australia does it is interesting, right? Because it's saying you don't, you, you have price estimates, I think is what Farhad um, was telling me earlier about this problem, that you receive some estimate of what we think the market price is going to be. And that way you can kind of, you know, adapt your bid around this. Whereas in the European market right now, so you have the same problem, right? Like generators have non-convexities, they have to internalize them somehow. Hmm. But the way that the European system works is that um, they're allowed to bid with integer variables. So they're allowed to say, okay, I still have to give you a simple price quantity bid, but I can say you either have to take the whole thing or not take it at all, right? You yep. can't take a yep. marginal um, amount of it because that would kind of mess with my internal calculation of how I thought I could recover my costs. Um, but the, the flip side of doing it that way is you still have a really hard problem to solve as the system operator, because now you have still a problem that has a lot of binary variables in it. And it's hard to, you can't derive a price from an optimization problem with binary variables immediately. You have to make some decision about how you're going to relax the problem to get those prices out. And the way that the European system does it is the, or the way that Euphemia does it, at least to, to my knowledge, um, is that they say, okay, 
we're not going to worry about getting the social welfare maximizing dispatch decision, right? We're kind of going to throw that, throw that out the window. We want to find a decision at which everybody who is cleared in the market does not operate at a loss, right? And we're not going to worry about the people who were not cleared, who wish they were cleared given that price, right? So the ones who would like to be cleared at that price, but weren't have a lost opportunity cost. Um, and so this is actually something I explore in a different paper is, you know, to what extent can agents in a market like this, where there are non-convexities, chase after those lost opportunity costs? Can they bid strategically in a way that they can try to recover them? And, you know, what that does anytime that's happening is it ultimately means it's it's worse for consumers at the end of the day, right? The more that a producer can kind of chase the excess profit. Yeah, I totally understood all that. And I could definitely come up with another slinky analogy. Uh, but I, I, yeah, it's it, it's the differences in the way markets um, have struggled with this problem. And specifically, Australian and European markets is exactly what we we're trying to get to in this episode to try to explore the different ways we're solving these different problems. So thank you. We we had a lot of conversation about non-convex price. Do we want to pick on Farhad a little bit before we move on um, and talk a little bit about the reliability? Um, and the reliability insurance overlay. Do you have some questions for him? We we have like a minute or two if we wanted to pick on him a little bit about his concept. Do you have any <laughs> questions, Conley or Elmas? No, I think we're good. Okay, well, I'll pick on you a little bit, Farhad, because uh, when I was doing going through my analogy, I was like, okay, Dr. Carrie Breaker's idea that I I loved uh, from her. It was on Twitter. I don't know why I keep crediting her for it, but it was great, and I that's where I found it. But like, it was, it was, how do you get on the plane? When do you choose not to get on the plane? And my, my, uh, my TikTok barred example, I failed to land it, but it's like, you're, and this is picking on you and I understand it, but it's like, you're getting on the plane and, and you get to choose when to jump off with a parachute. Is that fair? Is that bad? I'm not sure I actually understand the, the, <laughs> the actual the plane analogy but i'll kind of yeah exactly yeah yeah <laughs> exactly you don't know, because it's probably wrong uh, no. but it is i will I'll, I'll i'll tweak it a little bit because um these are you're participating in this insurance market if you have flexible resources and then you can say when you want to when your price sensitive when your uh, value of loss load would exceed a certain price and you're right. you're paying for that reliability and then if you are dispatched you'll you would get you you would get turned off um once and get compensated for turning off i think is how this works correct yeah so this this kind of links to um a much uh, this was actually one of the the earliest papers in sort of modern electricity markets with this idea of um what's called priority service so yep. essentially this idea where you could start to choose your level of reliability um essentially by you know selecting off a menu of options um and so you know you would have different potential uses of, of electricity and different things that you use it for and you'd be able to self-select you know um how, how you you know the, the level of reliability that you want for particular uh, particular parts of your your usage profile um and so the, the the challenge kind of becomes how do you create the incentives for the person that's providing you that service to to do what they say they're going to do and, and guarantee you that reliability and that's where insurance comes in because it creates okay. a financial framework for um, for the the provider of that service to actually guarantee you that service or, or, or aligns those intent incentives because ultimately um, it's great having insurance but if your insurance company goes um, doesn't doesn't you know pay you out when you actually need it what's the use of insurance and so that's yep. kind of what we're trying to do with this model is is to create a financial framework for the provider um, to you know to kind of guarantee that level Fox, you do you go through that? go ahead Amaz. um sorry I, i'm gonna ask you to poke a hole in your own theory uh farhad so <laughs> um take it i hope you're a good sport about this yeah absolutely um how can that possibly go wrong right so i when <laughs> i think yeah. about so so uh insurance markets I, I i should say that i i don't believe that markets can can supply everything that that we as a society needs 
Um, and when I think about people paying for um, you, know, you know their level of reliability, I think about the people who can't pay being the ones who are going to get the the worst service. Um, so how, how, how do you ensure a minimum um, reliability uh, like that's necessary, uh, even for folks who who can't afford to pay to play? Yeah, I, th I think that's um, that that issue of you know equity. Um, and, and social justice is a really important part. And that's kind of why with this model, um, the overlay that we've developed is essentially um, in the form of a central, you know, central agency overlay. Um, so the, the idea here is that you can incorporate that in the same day way um, that you think about equitable tariffs in, in, electric, in the electricity sector. So, um, we can't, you know, the same way that we decide with with how to charge folks for transmission service and the like, um, you know, there can be equity considerations included as part of that. And and one, I think one recent example is um, some of the changes in tariffs in in California, on the, particularly on the fixed demand side, a fixed demand charge side of things. And so that's one way, and and essentially that that that's where the role of that agency is in determining what's that equi equitable split. The other way of also dealing with this is through some sort of subsidy. Now we, we commonly have um, um, subsidy type programs to deal with um, vulnerable uh, consumers. For example, in the UK, they have a program called the UK Warm Home Discount. Um, and those are again, similar ways in which you could allow um, those who are vulnerable um, and those who are less able to pay to, to still be able to access those services. Um, and, and ultimately, you know, it sort of also depends on the design of the scheme. Now, if, if you create, for example, an, an, an opt-in framework versus an opt-out framework, those are two sort of divergent approaches, but an opt-out would essentially say, you know, everyone gets this high level of reliability unless you want a lower level of reliability. And so that allows people to, to essentially opt out, but it, it sort of essentially, you know, means that everyone else um, sticks with that sort of higher level. Um, an opt-in would kind of look at it the other way and say, hey, look, every, no one gets any, any guarantee unless you want to pay for it. So there's, there's two different ways of, of dealing with it um, with, with different equity implications for that. Um, and I think ultimately it's just a matter of, of designing the scheme and making sure that you've got all those sort of safety levers in the same way that we do for, for the energy markets, right? We've got, we've, got this, we've got frameworks that we deal with for vulnerable consumers, for um, issues of social justice, of income inequality, and the like, um, it's taking those same principles and then applying it to to an insurance framework as well. But one follow up on, on that topic: it, it as I was reading through your paper, I may have misinterpreted it, um, but it seemed like when you instituted this mechanism, it it improved the reliability for everyone, not just the participants in the framework. Did I interpret that right? And you were running through those numeric examples. It seemed like yeah. one of your outcomes was everybody's service got better, which is well, it does yeah. have some intuition to it. Yeah. I mean, I, everyone's service got better because it was more aligned with their um, reliability preferences. So it doesn't mean that everyone got the same level of reliability. It just means that it was better aligned with what their value of loss load was. So okay. um, participants who had a higher value of loss load would, would experience less, um, less outages and those with lower values of loss load would experience more, but, but they would, everyone would still be better off because it's, 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 a, it's a more granular way of, um, of um, interruption or so, you know, of, of demand curtailment. Okay, we got wonky there. I enjoyed every minute of it. Uh, can I, can I add a follow-up? Please, please do, Conley. Great, yeah, and Farhad, I really enjoyed this paper. I think this is a really interesting idea. I'll reveal myself yet again as a regular uh, listener to the podcast, but I know Jacob Mays was on here before and Frank Wolak as well, and so there was some yeah, discussion. You are a regular the, listener, holy yeah, cow. Yeah, it's true, it's true. Uh, that there was some discussion of the standardized fixed price forward contract proposal, yes. right? Where, yes. you know, so there are some similarities, I think, to this. And I would be really happy to hear your thoughts on kind of the pros and cons of these approaches. You know, I think one 
kind of easy criticism of the standardized fixed price forward contracts approach would be, you know, how do you verify that all these retailers are fully hedged, right? You know, like that administratively might be really hard to do. And I'm I'm curious, you know, do you think that there's it's a good idea to kind of move this risk of figure or of figuring out, you know, are you doing a good job or not doing a good job hedging these resources to like this insurer? And, you know, kind of what are the what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. And I think that I mean that's a really good point because um when we think and this is sort of that that goes back to the you know the the opening statement that you really have to understand the market design in question. So for example, um I know one of the you know the potential applications of of Professor Wallach's scheme is is in Cal in Queso in California, um, which doesn't have a which is a regulated retail market. And so there mm -hmm. um you know while they have community choice aggregators and the like, um, you know, essentially the big three, uh, there's still a very strong regulated presence. And so when you have a regulated retailer managing wholesale risk that they can essentially just pass through through a regulated process to the end consumer without having to deal with um, managing essentially that level of risk aversion and through forward mm -hmm. contracting, that's where you get potentially some of those gaps emerging um, relative to you know other markets. And so I guess one of the app potential applications that you could use to couple with this sort of you know fixed price contract idea, which is essentially the contract form. And, and I think Jacob and, and, and one of his students has a really good follow-up paper on the issue of contract form. You know, what, how do you look at options versus um, 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 forward contracts versus just letting participants run their own portfolio book and, and contract whatever they want themselves, whatever is optimal for themselves. Um, and so the, um, the insurance um, framework could be used as a way of better aligning the incentives um, and essentially creating that penalty for mismatch. So, you know, the, the, the forward contract is essentially a the contractual mechanism for which you get that balance, um, but the penalty for which you know you, you're over or under could be through some sort of insurance framework. So I think there's you know there there is um, potential application here, um, and and again I think it's it's important just figure out when we apply these different models and different designs, um, you know the market that we're applying to it, it's sort of not that one size fits all. I think that's really something where that you know it, it becomes important to understand when you think about incompleteness because um different markets have have different levels of incompleteness and and you know um and the need for these adequacy mechanisms may vary across different markets as well yeah, yeah really that's interesting a really interesting take yeah it's a great callback too thank you conley for the callback to the prior episodes it's, uh, i'm flattered um uh we're running uh, we're running long so up next we're going to hit a quick break uh for a uh, sponsor promo and when we come back we'll get to almaz's insightful question of the week public power underground is brought to you by nwppa the northwest public power association believes in the power of training and education every year more than 6500 public power employees learn and network at our classes webinars workshops and conferences nwppa offers more than 200 event 250 events wowzer to choose from in areas such as leadership engineering operations accounting and finance communications and many more sometimes this very podcast public power underground is broadcast live from one of our events we call that being more powerful together what will you learn this year find an event that's right for you at nwppa.org forward slash catalog that's nwppa.org forward slash catalog up next is our Almaz's insightful question of the week uh Almaz, this week you have to make it very hard and very unfair so we can have very short answers because we're running out of time so okay. please i know you can do it make it really unfair take it away all right so I'm, I'm i'm gonna ask you what we're not i've asked this question about resources so i love the market perspective but a lot of times when we're trying to fix you know create a new thing to fix an old problem we get so fixated on what we're doing to fix the thing that we don't think about what we're doing is actually doing that might actually be making another problem or even exacerbating the original problem so as we think about markets moving forward 
um, what are we not thinking about? Like what, what could all the things that we're doing um, turn around and backfire? Um, like how can it turn around and backfire on us? Uh, I can go first if you want. Um, so I, I think um, in Australia we have this, and I'm, I'm, I hope it's a, a US thing as well. We have this game called Jenga, which is like, I don't know if you have it. Yeah, yeah. yeah, we got it. Yeah. Oh yeah. All right. We got so, yard Jenga. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So it's like, it's like a Jenga set of Jenga, a Jenga block, right? Like mm -hmm. you've got the foundations of electricity market design that have, have really been around for, you know, for a long time and, and they are foundational um, elements. And so we've sort of built this, this edifice on top of it. Um, now, the biggest problem for us right now is we've got all these ideas and all these proposals is sort of figuring out which block to remove and which block to put on top. Um, you know, obviously those ones at the bottom are really important. They're the sort of structural foundation of the entire um, market design. And so, you know, I think we've got to be really careful um, when we, when we sort of take out some of those bottom rungs, because those are, you know, those are the, the entire structure of the, of the system. And, everything could come crashing down um, if we if we do that. So we've, I think there's some really great ideas out there, but I think again, market design is, is something that we've got to think about carefully and go through that process. It's not a quick, you know, political process that should happen quickly. It should go through um, consideration, through experts, um, through a wide variety of stakeholders. The Jenga block analogy is perfect. Conley, what's your, what's your take on Alaz's hard question of the week? Yeah, so my take on this is that what we're not thinking about enough is political risk. So the political risk that we don't get to play the game anymore if something goes wrong enough that there's a, a backtrack of doing electricity markets at all, right? So we saw this a little bit with Texas where, you know, maybe this is a fairly efficient way to run a short-term market, but if you have a huge disaster like Winter Storm Uri, and you weren't really thinking about, you know, do you actually have resource adequacy handled very well in this kind of design, then there's a risk that, you know, you, you know, ERCOT has to, you know, get rid of its current technical staff or, it, you know, and maybe doesn't make the most optimal decisions moving forward because of it, because there's just a lot of political pushback to what happened or thinking about what almost happened in Europe, right? Where during the energy crisis, which again was this big political risk that we didn't necessarily have a plan in place of what happens if there's a huge supply shock and what are we going to do? And that led to a lot of politicians suggesting, why don't we scrap the market altogether? Even though, you know, from the economic side, we think actually this has probably done us a lot of good. And so I would say that the political risk of, you know, what happens when those extreme events occur? And does that mean that, you know, we end up not having an electricity markets anymore, that could be a risk. Yeah, I'll tell you, there are people in those markets that think a lot about um, what happens in those cases and really are conservative yeah. because of it. Thanks, Almaz. Do you feel good about the answers? I do. Okay, well, good. Uh, that's all we have time to cover this week. Before we get to Conley's closing thoughts, I wanted to say thank you to all of you. Uh, Farha, do you feel valued and appreciated? Absolutely, thank you. Conley, do you see, see, feel seen and heard and like, uh, like this was a fun experience for you? Very much so. Good. Uh, I am flattered that uh, you have listened to episodes before. <laughs> I'm su super, super flattered. Amaz, do you feel seen, heard, valued, and appreciated? Do you feel good about this? Not always, Paul. Okay. That's all we got this week. Take it away with your closing co uh, thoughts, Conley. Oh, thank you very much for having me on. It's been a great conversation. After extreme weather events in recent years led to blackouts in California and Texas, the suspension of the energy market in Australia, and the energy crisis in Europe that led to discussions about scrapping marginal pricing entirely, I would argue that we're at an inflection point in electricity market design. The energy transition raises questions about what markets can and can't do well, underscoring a tension between centralized planning and designing markets as a tool to achieve the societal outcomes we want. I think it's important to remember that historically, electricity sector liberalization or deregulation wasn't done because of a careful cost-benefit analysis. It was ideologically driven. The bet we're making now is that our imperfect markets can do better by consumers in the long run than an imperfect central planner, especially over large geographic areas. I do think that's true, but it's worth remembering that we are making this bet. 
Now that over 100 nations have committed to a goal of carbon-free electricity by 2050, achieving this goal while increasing electrification is going to mean that we need an estimated two or even threefold increase in global electricity production by 2050 compared to today. That will require a massive investment in new generation and transmission capacity. To the extent that we want to use markets as a tool to procure these new resources, it's important that we get the core of markets, the real-time energy market, to provide as efficient a signal as possible about where and when electricity is needed. In regions without locational price signals, like much of Europe, we won't ever see the counterfactual, but we know we're leaving some consumer welfare on the table. As for the future of the short-run market, there is also a concern that we will have very bipolar prices that are mostly zero with occasional very high price spikes. I don't think this is necessarily what will happen. Bringing in an active demand side, power to X applications like converting excess wind and solar to hydrogen and batteries bidding opportunity costs could all reduce this concern. An active demand side with advanced smart grid technology could also enable us to better represent a consumer's true utility function, allowing us to differentiate in terms of scarcity or in times of scarcity or an extreme weather event between electricity to heat a swimming pool and electricity to heat a home to a safe level. Nothing about the math of energy markets theoretically incentivizing optimal operation and investment decisions changes with lots of zero prices and occasional high price spikes. But what does change, I think, is that this volatility brings to light that we will likely need better ways to facilitate risk sharing in practice when it comes to investment and resource adequacy. This is where the discussion of potentially moving to hybrid markets comes from. The short run market represents competition in the market and some kind of long run organized market could provide competition for the market. On top of this, we will have to determine to what extent we wish to rely on markets to plan for extreme events versus rely on regulatory standards. We also have to figure out how to best preserve efficient operating signals while protecting consumers from high prices. I don't think we have a final answer yet on what the breast approach will be, and it might vary by, by region as well, but the decisions we make now have the potential to influence how, how fast, and how much it will cost to decarbonize the grid. We started in hard times to bring us all in. Public Power Underground is a production of Seattle City Light and News Data. The views expressed to your own and not the official views of Seattle City Light, Tacoma Power, News Data, or the organization of the guests also appearing on Public Power Underground. Public Power Underground is electric utility and electric utility adjacent news from a power department's perspective. Today's episode was written and produced by Paul Dockery and Almaz Nagesh. And it's edited and published by the stellar team at Pioneer Utility Resources with sound mixing by Lucas Smith and video editing by Brendan Delzer. Our theme song, Roll On Enthusiast, was rewritten, performed, and recorded by Aaron Guillory and Ian Bledsoe. You don't have to be subscribed to News Data's weekly newsletters to get this podcast, but it sure makes the podcast make a lot more sense. Public Power Underground for electric utility enthusiasts. Public Power Underground, it's work to watch. <laughs>